Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is um, student and staff recognition, but I believe there are none tonight. Okay, very good. Moving on to the next item is, is administrative reports. So um, tonight, um, Sarah Johnson uh, here to present on the Spooner High School Action Plan for this upcoming um, school year, the 2017-18. Um, wanted to share with you that this plan was developed in conjunction with multiple staff members. We had formed a school-wide title uh, team and are now a school-wide title school. So the action plan um, is pared down a little bit, but it is uh, in conjunction with that plan. So to overview the plan, basically what we were able to, de to determine from a pretty deep level of data analysis is that at the high school level, the two areas that we, we were going to hone in on uh, for the plan were to address the issues of a lack of growth um, in our students for reading and math, as well as a gap that um, we see emerging in our student population for reading and math, and that gap specifically is related to our students who have socioeconomic disadvantages compared to the students who do not have those socioeconomic disadvantages. So the meat of our plan um, is going to be focusing on the universal curriculum, which means the curriculum that all of our students have access to at the high school, as well as differentiated instructional practices, which means what all teachers are doing in their classrooms to basically meet that varied need of the student learners. And um, also, the plan includes a pretty comprehensive review of our current schedule to address any barriers for access for students to get that strong um, curriculum and differentiation. So the first piece, we've got two main focal points. One objective being tied for growth for all of our learners, and that's emphasized because when we look at our local data, our STAR data, we want to be able to determine that our students that are performing below benchmark as well as those that are meeting benchmark and those that are exceeding are going to be able to grow. We want to be able to offer them learning and program opportunities that will address um, all of our students in those uh, particular areas. So one of the major pieces of work that we are doing as a priority action in relation to this because there's, uh, you know, you can only bite off so much at one time. The district has focused on ELA, which is English Language Arts. So we did um, get CESA to come in to provide a comprehensive review of our um, curriculum and our instructional practices. So from that, the ELA team has been looking at um, the recommendations from that and focusing on efforts to increase access to learning for all students at grade level. We are working on um, disciplinary literacy for essential standards, which because we know that reading is a universal skill, it's not just the English language arts. We know that students read in social studies, they read in tech ed, they read in uh, math, they read everywhere. So we are looking at, um, based upon that review as well, how we can choose the essential standards that they can focus upon that well and be able to measure that growth. We also are looking at and um, have been and will continue to um, look at establishing universal grading practices, including policies for late work, um, and assessments, and that is tied to that um, gap. All of this is the growth and the gap for our students. We want to make sure that we're focusing on grading for learning. And the other points there to that development of universal curriculum, meaning um, we are looking in specifically the ELA department, but across the board, having um, teachers unpack their standards, which means they're looking at essential standards and they're looking at what it is students need to be able to know and be able to do and how they can show that. So those are the things that we're working on at Swinter High and then of course that, that bulleted point of reviewing the schedule. Making sure that we can show growth in the year for all learners. The next piece is uh, addressing that gap. So um, we know that uh, in the state of Wisconsin, the gap uh, is significant in comparison to the nation. 
And at Spooner High, our data is showing us that our gap is increasing with our students that um, have socioeconomic disadvantages compared to our students that don't. So we're spending time looking at transition activities, and those are associated with our school-wide title plan. So um, some of the changes that we've seen in um, open houses and conferences and engaging our uh, fam all of our families a little more in depth and talking about learning and their progress is a part of what our school-wide title plan included. We are also um, going working uh, in a phase to focus on data to determine our students who are at risk and working on providing more interventions and supports for those students. And then this last bulleted point, um, getting into the meat of professional development for our staff in order to be able to provide curriculum and instruction that meets those needs of our learners who are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged specifically for our data because we want to make sure that our teachers know how to um, inform their instruction so that they're doing that in a way that is culturally relevant to the students in their classrooms. Um, so those are our two main areas of focus based upon the data that we've reviewed, which is both local and state assessments. And the last um, slide here addresses those phases because it's a lot of big work. We broke this into phases, uh, the first phase being August through October. So these uh, pieces have been completed. We have set goals. We have um, reviewed the ELA curriculum and instruction. We are now into phase two, which um, will bring us through February. And in that space, our uh, ELA and reading uh, curriculum is being pretty deeply analyzed and we're working on that work right now. Um, the ELA team is working on selecting the essential standards for grade levels, and we are working uh, upon all of those recommendations throughout this year, tightly with the CESA representative who assisted us with that process. We are also looking at scheduling and course progressions. Our ELA department has been analyzing the course offerings, uh, of course tied to that gap piece to make sure that all of our learners have access to high level quality instruction. And we also have um, that focus here coming up in the January and February professional development days will be that um, review of the disciplinary literacy pieces and the culturally relevant, relevant practices. Going into the final phase of just this year, March through June, um, we will be, of course, looking at our mid-year data to see if there have been improvements based upon the things that we have been doing with our transition and with our rails time to see if we have growth, um, a growth um, percentile that projects a trend toward the positive, as well as looking at that data for where that gap exists for our students. We will also be creating um, comprehensive plans to continue that process. The curriculum development process is um, lengthy, it takes time, it takes discussion, it takes um, re pretty comprehensive review, and so we are going to continue that plan, noting that ELA should be done this year, but math will be our focus for next year is the prediction, but that will happen in phase three of this year. And um, just spending time learning, like I said, about those specific areas, youth mental health is another one, trauma-informed practices to make sure that we have um, teenagers in, in our classrooms that we know how to help them um, so that they can learn when they're in our classrooms. And then just look at, we're going to be looking back at our um, how we've made those adaptations with the um, freshman first day and the open houses and the way we're formatting conferences to determine if how we have changed that has had an impact on our students and on our communication. So those are the phases of the plan for 2017-18 for Spooner High. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for presenting that, Sarah. Um, I have first-hand knowledge of some of these issues with my own family. Yeah. And I concur that uh, there is not a policy or a good policy that's across the board for taking, re, you know, retesting and whatnot. Um, so I hope that that's able to get figured out rather soon because it certainly puts people at a, a disadvantage depending on which teacher they're assigned to, that makes no sense. And then the other one uh, that I concur with and have concerns with are the classes and the scheduling and I know you're concentrating on reading and math, uh, but there are other classes that are offered that, because of the demands on 
uh, student time that kids are not able to uh, elect. Um, I can say music, for example, would be one where it just wasn't offered at, at a time where math or reading wasn't offered, and hence that's the end of that. And that's, you know, disappointing for anybody who wants to uh, do some arts and, uh, you know, some of the artistic uh, components of going to high school. So, again, I think you're right where you should be, and I just hope that this stuff can get implemented so we don't have to wait certainly more than a year for this because these are some real good needs. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the presentation of district and school DPI report cards. Good evening, Dr. Dave Aslan, District Administrator. I'll be briefing on the district report card. As you can see, uh, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the report card that was issued one fall ago, which was for the 2015-16 school year, and the, uh, the report card that was issued last month, which was reporting on the 16-17 school year. You can see that uh, that there has been some improvement when you look at the you look at the upper left where there's the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get a lays on that for you from this distance, but uh, you can you can see that the district has had an increase in points and uh, is now in the category of meets expectation. So that that certainly is some progress that uh, that we're pleased about, but we also know that there's a lot of uh, uh, progress that still needs to be made. Um, next slide, please. As we as we take a look at the elements of <coughs> the report card, yeah, you can see here, and again, you find this in the upper left hand corner of the full report card. The first piece of it is an overall score. Beginning in the 2011-12 school year, a comprehensive accountability index replaced the old adequate yearly progress system. This index approach uses multiple measures and classifies schools along a rating continuum, and you can see that continuum on this slide, uh, ranging from at the bottom, fails to meet expectations, to the top, significantly exceeding expectations. There was a, a so report cards have been issued since the, uh, since the 2000, fall of 2012 with a one-year hiatus in 2014-15 school year. Next slide. So as we look at the pieces of the report card, in the priority areas, the first piece is student achievement. Student achievement measures the level of knowledge and skills among students in the school compared to state and national standards. And it includes a composite of reading and mathematics performance for all student groups in the Wisconsin Student Assessment System for all grades tested. So in the district, uh, the district card, these are all uh, all students in the district being tested. If you look at that, you'll see that we fall slightly below the state average in student achievement. Next, please. The next area is student growth. Student growth describes how much student knowledge of reading and mathematics in the school changes on a year-to-year -year basis. It uses a point system that gives positive credit for students progressing towards higher performance levels and negative credits for students declining below proficiency. It's important to note that beginning last year, the state adopted a value-added format which in school districts or schools that have a greater than 35% level of students coming from economically disadvantaged homes, the weighting system is weighted heavier for growth 
than it is for achievement. So you can see in our district we do fall slightly below the state average for the area of growth. Next. The next major area is closing the gaps. Closing the gaps shows how the performance of student groups in experiencing statewide gaps in achievement and graduation uh, are improving in the school. It recognizes the importance of all students improving while focusing on the need to close those gaps by lifting lower performance groups up. Some examples of those groups would be specific races or ethnicity groups, students with disabilities, students coming from economically disadvantaged homes, and English language learners when they're compared against their complementary groups. So if you look at this area, the closing of the gaps, again, we are uh, we fall uh, just, just below the state average now. Next slide, please. The next area is on track to graduation and post-secondary readiness. This indicates the success of students in the school in achieving educational milestones that predict post-secondary success. It includes things like the graduation rates for schools that graduate students, like the high school, or the attendance rate for the other schools. It also includes measures of third grade reading and eighth grade mathematics achievement, as well as ACT test participation and performance in high school. So this is an area that uh, certainly is a success where we have uh, we've exceeded the, the state uh, state average on that, and uh, that certainly is an indicator of uh, important forward progress in the district. Next. In the area of, uh, of uh, student engagement indicators, there are two indicators that we take a look at. Each indicator has a goal, and schools and districts that fail to meet the goal receive a point deduction from their overall score. And it's important to note that while schools and districts can lose points in that area, they cannot earn points in that area. Students and districts can meet the goals uh, by having an absentee rate below 13% and a dropout rate below 6%. And if you look at the Spooner Area School District, uh, the district lost no points. So that, that certainly is a success, meeting the standard in uh, in absenteeism and also meeting the standard in dropout rate. Next. Each of the report cards has uh, some demographic information. And uh, so as you look at the district report card, just some important pieces to take a look at. The top section just looks at grades served, attendance, uh, enrollment, things of that nature. In the middle, you can see an ethnic breakdown of the district. In the, in the bottom, probably among the most important metrics that we look as we track data as it relates to uh, the, the growth and achievement of students, we take a look at the amount of students, uh, the percent of students that are uh, receiving special education services under an individualized education plan. Also take a look at things such as uh, the level of uh, students coming from economically disadvantaged homes. I'll be followed by Mr. Stordoff with the elementary school report card. So this is our report card from last year, and I won't go over the individual components. Last year we were a meets expectations school, that was our overall score. <clears throat> this year we are still a meets expectations school, however our overall score went up pretty significantly from last year, several points, and we're actually now at the point where we're on the cusp of the next category, which would be exceeds expectations. Um, so a few different reasons why, um, but before we go on, um, just some specifics to point out. Looking at the student achievement and the school growth, we're both, uh, we're both below the state average in those two categories, which is something that we've known about and something last month when I talked about the, uh, the action plan for the elementary school was something that heavily informed our action plan and I'll talk about some of the things we're doing for that. Um, at the same time, we know that a lot of the things that we are doing are having an impact and we're continuing to, um, to put some things in place that we think will, will help bolster those categories. Um, really, uh, a credit to our, uh, our staff. Um, 
is the closing gaps piece where we significantly exceeded the state average um, by, uh, and it, especially in mathematics. And so, again, what Dr. Aslan was saying about closing gaps, what that means is we have a uh, significant population of economically disadvantaged students in elementary school. You can see it's, um, for last year's it was 55%. That's higher, we're the highest building in the district, which isn't, that's pretty typical of elementary schools. Um, typically have a higher rate of that for a number of reasons, but among other things, we probably get more forms returned than others. So, um, But we have that significant population. What that high score in the closing gaps means is that our teachers are really doing a, a really great job of, um, of having those students that are economically disadvantaged score uh, well on their achievement. So that's because of a lot of reasons, but you know, responsive practices, being aware of um, being aware of making sure that there's no inequity issues or minimizing those as much as possible. Um, so it's really a credit to uh, to our to our school and to our staff um, regarding those things. One thing I should point out too that our school report card refers to um, in the elementary school we have third and fourth graders that take the forward exam. So these uh, the report card is indicative of the students in third and fourth grade. That took the forward exam. However, we know that a lot of the information is reflective of all the grades in our building because it's pretty similar one through four. Um, so, moving forward, some things that we have, um, some things that we did last year and some things that we're doing this year. One of the things that we did last year to this year and probably shows up in, some, in that increased closing gap score is we intentionally staggered our intervention times throughout the building. So those would be times during reading and math where we um, have students that are either working on at grade level, above grade level, or below grade level um, tasks. And the below grade level tasks, those students are usually in smaller groups with more intensive kind of skills focused instruction. And we have, um, we have uh, two staff members that work just with those students. And so one of the changes we made that was reflective last year was we staggered those intervention times so that we, um, so that those people could be, work with students at every single grade level. So to try to maximize that piece. Um, another thing that we did was, starting this year, was um, the universal student goal setting for assessments. That was just having those intentional conversations before students took standardized assessments of here's how you, here's how you did, Here's a reasonable goal. Here's some different practices that you can do to try to, um, so that you can set your own goal and be more successful or be more motivated to do better on those. Um, we see that as an important thing just because we, you know, standardized tests aren't going anywhere and are an important factor for students. So setting, starting those, uh, those strategies early. Um, the next things I talked about last month, but those would just be the, the work that we uh, we knew we needed to do based on our information. So like I said, our student achievement is a little bit lower than the state average um, and our growth. So some work that we're doing at ELA, some work that we're doing in PBIS um, in terms of the classroom or the building environment throughout the school. Work with our power standards. And then the last piece, the development of the multi-layered or multi-tiered system of support. That's some of the work that Mitch is leading in terms of formalizing uh, some of the structures that we have in place for how we provide interventions and where and when and all of those things that's happening on a kind of a K-12 level. Having some more of that be put in place this year would be also something we'd be doing to address the, um, the work that we're doing for our report. I'll turn it over to Mr. Larrabee, middle school. slide that you have for the middle school, uh, that is a report card that I presented on last year for the middle school, um, so I won't speak to it a whole lot, you've kind of seen where we are. Um, moving forward, we focused in on some of the areas that we got information from last year, specifically um, as Dr. Aslan and Mr. Stordahl talked about looking at those subgroups. So if you look on the right hand side, I don't work with laser, but if you look at our student demographic information, um, the middle school uh, we have about 44% of our students that came in this year identified as socioeconomically disadvantaged. 
Um, that was a focal point for our work this year. Um, that is about 8% lower than last year. As Mr. Stordahl referenced, the importance of having our parents identify and fill out the free and reduced lunch forms is important because it helps us to know where we need to meet our students. Um, we've used that um, information to really drill down to look at where we're meeting our students um, in our intervention groups and in our academics in the classroom. Um, a little bit of difference uh, between the elementary and the middle school, if you look on the right hand side in our student demographics, last year grades five through eight, every student took the Wisconsin Forward Assessment. So we're the only building that has 100% of our population taking um, a state assessment. So all uh, 354 kids last year took the test that goes into the results of the state assessment. So when we see the initial score, being uh, an improvement to 69.1. Uh, that really is reflective of the work that our building has done. So um, I've been able to have some great celebrations with our teachers as we drill into this data that we get from the detailed report to look at where are we moving kids? What groups are we moving? Because as I talked about last year, we have that value added score for student achievement and uh, school growth that is kind of a sliding scale based on our socioeconomic status. So. Uh, at the middle school, this last year, we were about 31% uh, focused on student growth, so that carried a lot more weight. Um, and we, we know that we need to be able to focus on those kids to be able to say, okay, we need to close the gap with your counter group so that we can continue to grow. Uh, big celebration for the middle school this year. The student, perform or excuse me, student achievement is higher than the state uh, performance, so if you look at the the top score on there, you can see that a big celebration for us was that we outscored uh, the state when it came to those um, characteristics. So um, moving down the closing gaps is a big focus for our next school year because we again want to make sure that we're going to close and keep all of our students growing at a rate either equal to or greater than their counterparts. So if we're talking about students with disabilities or students with uh, low socioeconomic status, we want to be able to drill down to those students and make sure that we're going to continue to grow them. And that obviously helps our score on the report card. Uh, last month, similar to what Mr. Storrell had uh, spoke to, the middle school action plan was presented to you as a board. Um, obviously, the ongoing review of data, um, we're becoming data informed. Um, that is one of the platforms for the year, looking at how did we do on last year's uh, state assessments, but also how are we doing with our um, performance on the STAR assessment, which is our nationally normed assessment. And we want to be able to look at those as how do we continue then to look at the individual students and student groups so that we can program for those groups. So looking at how do we um, use our core instruction to meet students and also our intervention groups. Um, the student goal setting, again, as Mr. Stordahl said, that was working with students to look at how they are academically growing and having our teachers be able to set uh, attainable goals with students for when they're taking both our uh, STAR assessments and also the state assessments. Um, as I continue down, um, as I had mentioned before, with uh, PBIS and our universal behavior supports, at the middle school we also added the assessments and the self-assessments for our social-emotional growth. Um, every other year the middle school takes the youth risk behavior survey, and this is one of those years. So again, we're focusing on how do we educate the whole child. Academics is important, but we all know that the middle level uh, is really important for that social emotional growth as well. So we want to make sure that we're collecting information and working with students, not just in the academic realm, but also in the behavior and the social emotional realm as well. Um, and then again, the uh, audit or vertical alignment for our ELA and math curriculums um, and also our science and social studies teams are getting on board with this as well. So we're digging into how are we setting our instructional goals with students, how are we aligning our instruction with what our state and national levels are expecting us to do. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Johnson. So for the high schools, it's important to note that um, all high schools in the state of Wisconsin are measured based upon the ACT, which is um, based upon one grade level of testing. So we are not measured at a high school in the state of Wisconsin based upon growth. It is a one data point test. It is not longitudinal. And um, something that we've seen uh, that is important to note is that the prior testing used to be the WKCE, and we note that the ACT has a higher level of rigor associated with it, as that is the test that is um, 
what has been you know, historically used for college entrance, and that is the expectation for all students in the state. So in regard to Spooner High School, um, you can see this was last year's um, score that was meeting expectations. When you break it down in the student achievement area, you can see that both in ELA and math, that group um, performed just below the state average in achievement. And we did look at this report card as some of our deep work for figuring out our action plans. So you can see that, again, while the gap is a concern in the, in the state of Wisconsin, it's an even bigger concern at Spooner High School. So that has, um, for ELA and math, been the reason why we've been focusing on our curriculum pretty heavy in that area. Uh, we knew that information going into this year. And also what I wanted to point out is that the graduation rate is something that Spooner High could be proud of last year being a 93 score, um, which at, compared to the state was at a 90. So um, in addition to that, I would focus on that moving into this next one, um, where the 2016-17, the score for the high school did um, come in as a meets few expectations. And uh, focusing on that graduation rate, just because I wanted to transition from one thing to the next, our graduation rate does continue to exceed the um, state average. And I would say that, I just wanted to say that that's a reflection of our high school staff and our Washburn County Alternative High School staff as having an option for our students to obtain their diploma, which is obviously a very important life measurement. And so that's uh, something at Spooner High that we can be very proud of. In regard to the score and how this is measured, when we look at our, our student achievement for this cohort, um, which would have been the juniors last year taking that ACT, this, um, the achievement is lower. It did lower um, than the previous year on achievement in ELA and math. And then that growing concern for the gap where um, we, the gap for that group shows that we had an even larger um, difference between our students who come from socioeconomically disadvantaged students to those that do not. So all of that information is what informed our action plan and what will continue to inform a lot of the um, supports and interventions that are put into place at Spooner High, um, which speaking to that, I did just provide you a more in-depth um, report on how we are addressing those concerns. And you can see um, the one thing that I did say earlier, so I don't want it to sound like it's a contradiction, but the state report card is one data point. It is one measurement. Um, and so when I say that Spooner High has been looking at growth and gap, we look at growth because we have a local assessment, the STAR assessment, that gives us an indication so that we don't have to wait for the state assessment to come back and only at one grade point, the juniors, so we can look at our local data to make sure that what we're doing um, is in line with what we need to do. And we found that our local data shows that when uh, students come into Spooner High School, they have not been growing over the course of the year. And so that's why it's important for us to look at our core curriculum and include those plans for the interventions and put those all in place so that we're seeing growth along the way. Do you have questions for the administrative team about the state report cards? I've got one question. Would be that they're closing the gap as the gap gets narrower in the future years. Will our score drop because we haven't improved that gap? Because once it's closed, there's not much much to close, is there? Is that are we sure scores drop on that? In the I future? Can take that one. You know, that's a really good question. And and the answer the short answer is no, we're not penalized for that. In the value added formula, there's an allowance for districts that districts and schools that have made significant gains in the area of growth. And statistically, you can only grow so far. So the value-added formula allows for that when schools have experienced exponential growth over time. How do we know? How do you determine if somebody is, your data is reflecting the accuracy of those who are economically disadvantaged? What all they do is fill out a lunch application? I mean, that can't be. Sure, so our district level data is based upon the registration paperwork, um, as well as, you know, if uh, the district office could speak a little bit more to that, but it is based upon our student information system. So the information that we're provided 
um, informs that. But yep. Yep. there's also a statewide system that speaks to our um, school, our uh, software system that we pull in information from the state for people that are already registered as free and reduced. But you're right, we do rely on the validity of the um, the paperwork that we receive in. I would say also the title funding looks at census data, yep. so it's not just free and reduced. So it looks at the re you know the school area in the region and pulls out poverty statistics from the census too, and that is tied to funding and also tied to the free and reduced. So that'd be another indicator that we know that we have that. Okay, we do have enough indicators other than a form that somebody fills out that can say, well, yeah, I'm giving you an opportunity for a free lunch. Let's just fill it out. That, that's yeah. fine. It just seems we also have to qualify for free and reduced. It's not filling out the form that that triggers it. It's filling out the form and and meeting the criteria so that you are free and reduced. That's how. Okay. Well, I just that's yeah. fine. I'm glad you. Looking at other things because it could affect on how we do things and the metrics of how we measure things. Yes, so there there is a on the DPL website for the state of Oregon. There's a sliding scale that you can kind of play with. You know, if we went from 40 percent to 50 percent, if we went from 50 percent to 35 percent, and that changes the calculation for student growth and student achievement, right. um, and it ultimately affects <coughs> more. So it is important that we accurately reflect that, and we can check it somewhat with the census, but what the parents fill out in our system is what goes to the And you're pretty comfortable with those. I, I, I think if, if there are an error within that particular metric, it's it's probably on the side of under-reporting mm -hmm. as opposed to over-reporting. Okay. Okay. This is the first year, correct, that we went to school-wide title, district wide. How has that changed this process? And because it was at, it was through, just at the elementary school this last year, went to middle and high school. So what moving um, to the high school really did for us was provide the framework for the comprehensive data review and the multiple people involved in the discussions. Um, and then the funding also can support that interventionist, which we had at the high school. So um, that that's pretty much how reading and, or, or the reading intervention. Yes. Okay. Have we gotten to math? Um, but the exciting part is that um, that will be rolling out for this year even um, starting in January, basically. Um, in the second semester, our high school staff will be talking interventions, and but that's not going to require extra staffing at this time for this year. Okay. Now, obviously, your goal is to, help, is to exceed expectations in every building every year, and that's what we strive for. But is it I mean, is it practical to believe that we could ever do that no matter what, how you do things? Uh, I mean, that can't determine whether your effort, of course, but because of the, the funds that we have, the things that we can afford, the disadvantages that are given to us that we don't control, can we ever believe that we can almost expectations across the board? <laughs> it's a reasonable expectation for people that their school district and their schools make continuous progress in a positive direction. We know that, that that's not a linear journey from where we are now to exceeds expectations across the board. There's going to be ups and downs, but uh, is that what we should aspire for? Or is, is that a reasonable goal to shoot for? Certainly it is. confident we will. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't appear there are any more questions. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to the next item on the agenda are the board reports. I will start out with the personnel committee report. We met on Monday the 4th of December at 4.30. Um, all committee members are present along with Dr. Aslan and Sh Shannon Vendell. Um, we, the discussion and action item that we had was a task force update. We received a handout from Dr. Aslan and we referenced the mission of the task force, which is already, which has met already. One of them has at least. 
<clears throat> and then we convened into closed session to consider potential salary increase distribution, which took no action, and we had unemployment status update. Again, no action. We, we adjourned at 528 so that the next meeting could go on, and that would be the Buildings and Grounds Committee and uh, Budget. Robert? And we met at 5.30 on December 4th, and we, uh, the minutes are on file in the, uh, on the internet, and we had the following discussion and action items that were presented. Ruby's Pantry uh, presented, and I, I certainly wasn't uh, that familiar with what they were doing, but they are a pantry and a food service not-for-profit organization that utilize our alternative high school across the street from the middle school, serves over 200 families monthly. It provides food pantry service throughout the year on a need basis, and the funds are raised privately in order to sustain the operations. This is something that, that the community uh, is serviced by, and I'm glad that they came in to uh, make it known to the general public. Uh, some of us know about it and some of us don't, but we are contributing to that by allowing them to use our uh, one of our buildings, and we thank them for that. We heard from the Aviation Club. They're almost done with the airplane that they're making. Uh, they haven't painted it yet, they haven't tested it yet. I don't even think they've started the engine, but these are very close to being done, and they even asked permission to move another privately owned plane into the facility so that they could work on that. So uh, we, without question, authorized that as long as we were released from any liabilities on that project. And that's uh, what's going on there, and Barry Michelson is heading that up, and uh, you know, if it doesn't turn out for the school, we can always go into plane manufacturing here. So, thank you for the uh, enthusiasm with the Aviation Club. And next we discussed the, uh, a quick financial update by the business manager. Cash flow is on par, there's nothing unusual there is what they are telling us, and the estimated deficit for this year is expected to be approximately 52 to 54 K, which is very good compared to where we've been. Uh, there was no state funding update, nothing new to report. There was some discussion about some door safety mechanism that the uh, staff is working on and the students, but they are, they, we tabled it because there wasn't any uh, additional information to questions that we had had last month on that. Uh, there were follow-up discussions by the safety team. It was reported that there is nothing dangerous and hazardous that exists at this time, uh, but they are pursuing a few minor safety issues which will have no material effect on school finances. Uh, then we discussed the revenue limit exemption proposals, which by the way, are being presented today, later in the meeting, and that's something that we've been discussing for several months now, but it's a way to uh, raise money through the uh, taxing authority of the county for some energy uh, saving uh, devices that would help us save money over the long term in, in terms of uh, the energy that we would be saving over the lifespan of the building. And, and the committee uh, was told that we are going to get a proposal uh, tonight, a couple proposals to vote on, and they will not exceed $300,000 uh, in additional revenue. Uh, In, in, uh, in levies for this year and next year, and we'll hear from them soon. Uh, the next matter we discussed was the strategic planning that 
is done by the school from time to time. Uh, it was determined that we haven't had a really uh, good strategic plan in quite some time. The last one that we did a year or two ago was done without sufficient stakeholder input and was too complex for purposes of monitoring, monitoring and execution. The administration volunteered to put a comprehensive strategic plan together this, this coming calendar year, which would be 2018. And uh, it would be uh, it would be uh, performed uh, based upon stakeholder input. And if anything, stakeholder input is the primary uh, component of a strategic plan. And we expect to have a strategic plan. Uh, in place sometime in 2018. That's another matter the board will be voting on in the next uh, month or two. Uh, lastly, we approved, looked at the vouchers and we recommended that the board approve the vouchers tonight at the meeting. And at 6.20 we adjourned uh, upon motion and those minutes were presented to the uh, district office. That's all I have. Thank you, Robert. Um, are you going to report on the meeting, the special meeting that we had on the 11th of December? Well, the, the minute, and that was regarding the, uh, yes, the, we met, on what date again? On the 11th. On December 11th, it was a special budget committee <coughs> hearing, and we heard from four uh, health insurance brokers uh, who are going to uh, who asked us whether they could be our agents for health insurance for the coming year. Uh, and uh, a decision was not made, but they presented. There were four of them. Uh, the board needs to review and decide which one it wants to go with. Uh, by statute, we do have to have an agent to go out for bid to various insurance companies, and that's how we end up determining how much health insurance is going to cost us uh, every year. So that was the purpose for our meeting. No decision was made, but we heard from four of them, and we will review them. And in the coming month or two, we will make a decision, and uh, that's where we stand on that. Very good. Thank you. I'm Paul of the Curriculum Committee. Yes, we had a curriculum committee meeting earlier today. We have had two items on our agenda. Uh, the first item was the, an update on the elementary school, the kindergarten curriculum update. Um, there's a new curriculum that's being used by our educators in the um, kindergarten. Uh, they worked on it over the summer, putting it together, and that is now being implemented. The other item we discussed was uh, the first item was uh, no action, it was just an update informational type situation. The second one is an update on our English language arts. Um, Dr. Aston passed out a handout and explained where we are today, um, who from which school is uh, working on the plan, um, and where the future is for us, and what their needs are. Um, uh, the this update is going to have to take place, it takes over several years for us to evolve into what our students' needs are, so we need to basically do assessments to find out what the needs are, <coughs> have a, implement a plan to deal with that, and um, hopefully in the next couple of years we get it all figured out, and um, it's a good thing for everyone then. That's it. Thank you. And Kevin, can you report on the School Community Relations Committee? School Community Relations Committee met tonight at uh, 5.45. Uh, the first thing on our agenda was a uh, further discussion on the uh, Fair Aid Coalition. This was uh, brought to the board in the previous board meeting and uh, more information was requested. Uh, Fair Aid Coalition is uh, an active a group working on behalf of uh, school districts like ours, the small rural school districts, that are uh, pushing right now for uh, legislation that is posted for uh, a minimum $1,000 uh, student 
funding, which would greatly benefit this district if that were to pass. Um, this will be before the board tonight, later on the agenda, with the committee's support. Uh, the next thing on our agenda was uh, consider a stride program. And this is, right now would be probably through the Webster Siren Rotary, but it is not limited to the Rotary. It is an opportunity to have a structured uh, mentorship program uh, targeting mostly towards the high school. And this program would be able to allow anybody in the community to participate in it, unlike the Kids Hope program anybody in the community could participate in this program. Um, further discussion than that will be uh, at the next meeting. Um, next thing on the agenda was a discussion on uh, public feedback procedures and uh, how we would like to have response, make sure that the proper information goes to the proper channels and that and this is a continuing discussion that will be on the next meeting also. And, uh, Next thing on the agenda was legislative updates, and uh, a couple of them were read at the committee that uh, pertain to this school district. And that one is Assembly Bill 280 was signed into law December 6th by the governor. It's relating to financial, financial literacy and education in schools. This new law amends school district standards to require each school board to adopt academic standards for financial literacy and incorporate instruction in financial literacy into the curriculum in grades kindergarten through 12. Then uh, another new development on that there that uh, could go along with it, our Fair Aid Coalition could help with here, is a uh, task force was created to look at the school funding formula and that there. And uh, this was uh, December 6th. They've already had their first meeting in that there, but the posting I had is from December 6th. It's the Republican leaders of Wisconsin legislature have created a bipartisan task force to study school funding in the state. The panel announced Tuesday will hold its first meeting later this month with hearings across the state planned before issuing a report to the legislature by the end of the next year. Lawmakers say it's the first time uh, the funding form has been reviewed in 20 years. The panel will be co-chaired by Senator Luther Olson of Ripon, Joel Kitchens of Sturgeon Bay, both Republicans. There are four other Republicans and three Democrats on the panel. Other members include superintendents from Green Bay, Grantsburg, just down the road, and uh, the lobbyists from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, a University of Wisconsin-Madison education policy professor and a business operations director from the Messimer Catholic Schools. And that's all I have for legislative updates. And that uh, we adjourned at 6.30 tonight. Very good. Thank you for all those board reports. The next item on the agenda is um, number four, which would be part four community comments. There are no community comments to this evening. Going on to number five, discussion and action items, personnel recommendations. We have two personnel recommendations this evening. Uh, one is Keith Melton. Um, moving into a full-time special education paraprofessional position and Julie Soho uh, coming in and uh, backfilling the position, the part-time elementary position at Kate Melton that would be vacated. We'll need a motion to approve those hirings. I make the motion. I'll second. Robert has made the motion and Aaron has seconded motion to hire those two people. Um, all those, any discussion? I will abstain from voting on Kate. Thank you. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is the acceptance of donations. Two donations for your consideration tonight. The first comes from the Exxon Mobil Educational Alliance Program, and that is a uh, donation, a grant to the school or elementary school, in the amount of $500. And the second is a donation from the Spooner Health Clinic uh, going to the third grade English language arts text feature surgery, and that was uh, $50 worth of procedure masks and exam gloves for students and some surgical hats for demonstration. 
need a motion to approve um, those, to accept those donations. We'll make a motion that we accept those donations. I'll second that. Nathaniel has made the motion and Paul has seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we are always very grateful for any donations that we receive. Thank you very much. Fundraiser request. One fundraiser request coming before you tonight, and it uh, comes, uh, comes forward from uh, Mr. Hugh Miller, and that is to solicit funds for the purchase of equipment uh, to develop a squad to participate in the Skills USA Robotics Competition. And he is looking to raise up to $2,500 to cover the cost of kits, supplies, and expenses are required to compete in the Skills USA Robotics Competition. I'll entertain a motion. To make a motion to authorize the request. Second. Kevin has made the motion and Robert has seconded. Is there any discussion? I'd, I'd like to ask, is this an ongoing expense that every year he's going to have this going on? I guess that's the question. Is this a one-time deal or is this going to be an annual report? He's looking, looking to establish a club or a, a squad, I should say. So in all likelihood, there would be some fundraising that would take place every year in terms of uh, how much uh, funds would need to be raised from year to year. I can't speak to that. Thank you. I wish I would have looked at this a little more carefully to see that it was Hugh that um, made this request. Yeah, I was expecting somebody to be here and I didn't look at the, at the top name. I'm just wondering, Dr. Essam, do you have any idea of how he's going to solicit the funds? I, I do not, Mrs. Johnson. Perhaps you can speak to that? Yeah, what I'm aware of is that, um, so Kyle Linton is the advisor for Skills USA, and this would be the first year that we would enter into the robotics portion of it. So they've been working together to determine what would be needed for that piece, and then they were going to contact local businesses for donations. All right, so they're, and they're already aware of a few that would be interested in working with this. So they're looking for sponsors? Pretty much. Okay, very good. What I'm aware of. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. There are no requests for um, usage of, requests for out of district um, usage over the facilities. And going on to the next item, which is Item E, consider qualified vendors and bids for energy efficiency projects. So this is the first part of the um, energy exemption approval for tonight. Uh, as the information you provided uh, last week, this shows the bid sheets that came in from the two qualified providers who chose to bid on the projects. Um, it pretty clearly states out the um, items that will be going on each project in each phase and the total amounts and then the amounts left for contingencies. And uh, per the memo, it'd be the administrative uh, recommendation that we go with the lower bid of the two and that would be with Jamar. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion. Robert has made a motion to uh, <coughs> to to, uh, to uh, obtain additional revenue through the levy process of the energy exemptions. That, that's not the one. We're, we're looking... Accepting the Jamar bid. It would be the Jamar bid. Yeah. You're so one step ahead. That would be the next one. This one is just for the qualified provider. Well, I make the motion. You prepare right, the resolution easy. and I'll agree to the resolution. Oh, very good. So Robert's motion is to accept Jamar as the vendor. I will second that motion. All right, and Paul has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion? I have a couple of basic questions now. Their bid is less than 300000 correct? Correct. And it may truly come in. There's a little padding there, but 
this resolution authorizes up to 300,000. There's a chance we won't need 300. Is that correct? Well, we left the contingency funds in there to say that we would go to 300,000, and we have some alternative projects that could happen um, with those extra contingency funds in each of the phases. Some small replacements, I believe, some hand washing stations are in there, some lighting um, projects that we would use the contingency for. So the 300 would be completely used up? Yep. And would it be accurate to say that last year we did an energy exemption and that was valued at 300? Uh, slightly about 300,000 for last year. Yep. So uh, the tax bill for any particular individual would not be going higher? Because of this. You know, there's always because, of, because of this particular uh, issue, is that correct? Correct. And this, uh, and at what point would we know whether they come in on target and whether we get the get to do those extra items or not? Well, the first phase was the first phase projects would start this. Uh, you know, the largest portion is the roofing and the boiler, and the roof would start this spring. So we would have a um, pretty good indication probably before the end of the year if we would be able to use the extra contingency funds for the end of next year. Correct. For phase one, and then phase two is is out another year. So we'd have to, to wait until we got cycled through some of those projects to, oh. to communicate. And I, no, okay, and my last question is, uh, since we did this last year, we're doing it this year, and you're proposing that we do it next year, after that, is it going to go on year after year? Or tell me how that works. No, so this is taken out. The reason why we're pushing two, two years through now, or asking for two years through, Two years now is that once this goes, this will be going away December 31st for the duration of a thousand years. So we will not be able to utilize this again for our lifetime. According to the language by the statute right now, but in five years they can do whatever they want. They could change right. it, but as okay. of right now, that is what we're going off of. Okay, so in two years this expires. And we well, cannot we it, cannot do this after two more school seasons, correct? It expires on December 31st, but the statute is allowing us to project out for two years on December 31st of this year. Okay, so that there only could be two more levies this coming year and the year after that? The year after, in 1819 and 1920. Okay, that was my question. Yep. Thank you. Can I follow up? I've got one other question. The amount that's being um, put into the contingency, is that sent out in bids also, or is that this company committed to the extra projects, um, specifically the, the amount left over in the contingency? Is that being sent out for bids all no. over, and, or is this no. a commitment to that company that's a commitment. that also? Yep, that's a okay. commitment to that company also, based off the pricing that they have given us. Um, I have a question on CISA 10 fees. Yep, yep, that is something that you have to have a qualified um, provider to go through. You have to have a, a, um, a manager of the project, and CISA 10 provides that for us. That's not something that we can get around. Um, you have to have that in order to go through the energy exemption process. We have used McKinstry in the past, um, and then after McKinstry, we moved over to CISA 10. Thank you. Shannon, one more clarification. Uh, these items that that are being requested to be taken care of, they were all in a CISA 10 report regarding the building facilities, correct? Most of them fall under the facilities audit that was done last year, correct? And those items are of a priority in the minds of CISA as needs that need to be taken care of rather quickly, is that correct? When we engage CISA in talking about doing this two-year phase, we ask them to put their number one priorities first in, it, in order to get them done. And so yes, these would be what they consider to be the most um, important projects within the district right now. Okay, and these are in order to sustain the building and maintain some energy efficiency. They're not wish list items that if we had money, this is what we would do, nope. correct? No, nope. these are roofs, boilers, um, some controls, mechanical lighting, and uh, hand washing stations as well that are included in these. Okay, thank you. No further discussion. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, let's do a roll call vote. Aaron Burke. 
Yes. Nathaniel Nodding? Yes. Julie Rich? Robert Holman? Yes. Karen Swanson? Yes. Kevin King? Yes. And Paul Johnson? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. The next item on the agenda is to consider resolution for revenue limit exemption for energy efficiencies. These are just the resolutions to supplement um, going with qualified providers, so we'll need an uh, action on resolution for phase one and an action, an action item on resolution for phase two. All right, so uh, which one shall we go with first? Phase The phase one? 1819 resolution language. Um, do I need to read this? No? Okay, so the, the first resolution is for the amount to be levied, levied and expended is $300,000 school year 2018-19. Can I have a motion for I that? I make that motion. All right, Nathaniel has made the motion. And the second by? I'll second that. By Kevin. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Karen Birch? Yes. Nathaniel Nelly? Yes. Julie Rich? Robert Holman? Yes. Karen Sorensen? Yes. Kevin King? Yes. And Paul Johnson? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second item is phase two resolution for the years 2019 and 20 again for three hundred thousand dollars who would like to make that motion i'll make that motion i'll second paul has made the motion and nathaniel has seconded it second is there any discussion hearing none a roll call vote please Aaron birch yes nathaniel nye yes julia rich Robert Holman? Yes. Karen Sorensen? Yes. Kevin Payne? Yes. Paul Johnson? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Item G on the agenda is the Fair Aid Coalition membership uh, information. Of joining, considering joining the co coalition. This uh, was brought forth from the committee meeting earlier tonight there. Um, the committee that's already just been formed looking into uh, redoing school funding or reviewing it and that there uh, this fair aid coalition would be a big part of that I would think in having those discussions um, I guess I'm kind of a believer if you sit and do nothing nothing is what you're going to get so I feel we have to advocate for ourselves so I would support us joining the Fair Aid Coalition. Um, if I could make that a motion at this point. Okay. I will make a motion to have the school district, school district join the Fair Aid Coalition. I'll second that. So Kevin has made the motion for school district to uh, consider joining the Fair Aid Coalition and Aaron has seconded it. <laughs> is there any discussion? How much is it going to cost us? It's two fifteen per student. $2,795, approximately. For the year. But if they can pass this uh, bill that they're pushing for, for $1,000, that would be way, way ahead on that one there. Because I think our financing right now from the state is about $400. $400 for a student or somewhere there. I'm curious, as to how much the student, I don't know anything about the group. I don't know what type of group. past performance history they have, um, what schools are, how many schools are involved in this or currently enrolled, um, what have they done in the past, but I don't know. But, and I understand the wish list that we'd like to see this happen. Um, I can say that the budget committee met in our auditorium last fall and the legislation legislature and the Senate passed bills that would help our district and they got vetoed from the governor's desk. So I have no clue. I, I mean, we're only looking at a hundred dollar, one hundred dollar increase is what those bills had in them. And our governor vetoed that. And our legislature and our Senate refuses to get together to overrule our governor. 
So I don't know what we're spending our money on with the hopes that they would pass something for us and that our governor won't veto it anyhow because the last time they met in our auditorium, I don't know how much closer we can get to working with our lawmakers to help our district. I don't see, I don't know what this group is going to do for us. What didn't already happen last fall got vetoed by our governor. I could say one thing. Um, I know you've had some past experiences with Bayfield and that there, but uh, this uh, commission that they have formed will be reporting at the end of this year. The next year, next election cycle, things may change and they may have a more uh, persuasive ear to what we have to say. How many schools are signed up for this? So, so their membership is somewhere in about the three dozen range. The Fair Aid Coalition <coughs> is an advocacy group that represents school districts like our school district that have a high, uh, high dollar value of property and a static or declining enrollment and subsequently uh, have ongoing cuts in, uh, in general aid. The, the membership of the group has, has grown every year as a result of the number of school districts that are in the same category that we are where uh, the state aid in the Spooner Area School District, state general aid, has declined approximately 10% a year for the past handful of years and without some change in the funding formula will continue into the future. We currently get roughly $450 per year from the state funding, correct? For general aid, yes. And what your hope would be is that this group can get together and help us more than double what we're already getting. That, that, would, be, that would be the hope. It would also be to address the inequity in the state funding formula, whereas in the state of Wisconsin this year, if you're a secondary level student in a Wisconsin voucher school, you have about $8,300 of general aid behind you. And if you are a student in the Spooner Area School District, you have less than $500 of general aid behind you. So there's a great disparity in the state funding system. It has, uh, we're, we're optimistic with this blue ribbon panel being assembled because it's the first time in two decades that the state funding formula has been examined. But uh, and, you know, as you indicated, Paul, there are no guarantees in this. Uh, that, 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 that is the case. But uh, you know, as Kevin has said, it, it's important that our voice be heard, and membership of the Fair Aid Coalition, I believe, is a is a good way to make our voice heard and to be part of a larger group of schools that are in our same situation that uh, are saying uh, our students deserve fair funding, just like all students in the state do. I would say that uh, one thing to consider is a voucher school that were to start up within our district boundaries is going to get eight thousand dollars a student, seven to eight thousand dollars. We're getting a little over four hundred. In the average state uh, school in the state of Wisconsin, and I believe there's like four hundred and something uh, districts in the state. The average school gets five thousand per child. Shell Lake gets five thousand, and we get four hundred. So you know we're like, I, I looked at this several months ago. We are out of four hundred and something schools. We are in the lowest 10, 10 schools in the entire state of Wisconsin. It's a joke, and we've been able to muddle through. I don't know how we can have the deficit that we have today with the way we've been treated for the past 20 years. Um, but if the community knew that those were the facts, I think the community would be outraged. And because uh, I know I am, because it's not even, it's, it's so unfair. A student in Spooner deserves nothing. And five miles down the road, they get uh, Ten times as much as we do from the state of Wisconsin, and uh, you know you think about that for a minute, and it's a broken system. 
And I think anything we can do uh, to facilitate change, we should take advantage of. I mean, it's $2,200 is immaterial, but if it's a good organization, it adds pressure to the politicians to do the right thing because they're obviously not doing the right thing today. Doing nothing at all would guarantee you that you will be held at the funding level that you are right now. They will take the money and disperse it to other districts. We also discussed at committee where that money would come from. <coughs> Could you speak to that, Dr. Aslan? Yes, we are uh, we're at the halfway point in the current fiscal year. We know that there are some areas of the budget that we have not spent to the level that we budgeted. So we know that, uh, that we can afford to pay this, uh, this membership fee and uh, not have a negative impact on teaching and learning in the district. Thank you. We have a, we have a, a motion and a second and we've had discussion. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call vote. Aaron Birch? Yes. Daniel Nolan? Yes. Julia Rich? Robert Holman? Yes. Karen Sorensen? Yes. Kevin King? Yes. Paul Jackson? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. The next item on the agenda is to consider the resolution for a line of credit. Uh, I believe in July the board approved CCF Bank <coughs> as the uh, bank of choice for the district and that also approved um, utilizing a line of credit for when cash flow um, becomes a little tight, um, typically in December until we receive our first tax payments. This is just the resolution that uh, supports the temporary borrowing, uh, which we'll need to start utilizing probably towards the end of December. And that's because of the tax. Yep, so we, since we are such a, you know, piggybacking off this conversation, since we are such a high property value district and we utilize uh, the, the monies that we receive in from the tax levy uh, supplement most of the uh, revenue for the district, we tend to get low on cash come December because uh, January would be that first tax installment when we would receive those payments in. Good, thank you. Is there a motion uh, for resolution authorizing temporary borrowing? I'll make the motion. Robert has made the motion. A second. And Aaron has seconded it. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, a roll call vote. Aaron Birch. Yes. Nathaniel Nolan. Yes. Julie Rich. Robert Holland. Yes. Karen Sorensen. Yes. Kevin King. Yes. And Paul Johnson. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. The next item, item six, is to convene into closed session to consider potential salary increase distribution and employee status update pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 1985, Parent 1, Parent C, to consider, uh, to consider the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. Is there a motion? I make that motion. Nathaniel has made the motion. I'll second. And Aaron has seconded it. A roll call vote, please. Aaron Birch. Yes. Nathaniel Nolan. Yes. Julie Rich. Robert Holman. Yes. Karen Sorensen. Yes. Kenny King. Yes. Paul Johnson. Yes. session we took up the topic of consider potential salary distribution uh, the board unanimously the board approved taking the allotted certified staff distribution and combined with the administrative distribution less sixteen hundred dollars and evenly distribute it among the certified staff 
less than nine employees who received a wage increase in the 2016 and 2017 contract. That is what the board did. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Motion to adjourn made by Nathaniel. Seconded by Robert. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. The meeting ends at 9, 19 and a half. Everybody, coming up, but the thermoshots.